Hip Academy is a pre-surgical educational presentation provided by Alaska Regional Hospitals Certified Total Joint Program. We will be reviewing information on preparing for surgery, home preparation for recovery at home, and what to expect while you are here at the facility. This educational information does not replace instructions provided by your surgeon or their staff. If discrepancies are noted, always follow your surgeon's specific instructions. In order to prepare for total hip surgery, it is important to understand some of the basic anatomy of the hip. The hip joint is one of the body's largest weight-bearing joints. It is a ball and socket joint. This helps the hip remain stable even during twisting and extreme ranges of motion. A healthy hip allows you to walk, squat, and turn without pain. But when a hip joint is damaged, it is likely to hurt when you move. In a healthy hip, smooth cartilage covers the ends of the thigh bone as well as the pelvis where it joins the thigh bone. This allows the ball to glide easily inside the socket. When the surrounding muscles support your weight and the joint moves smoothly, you can walk painlessly. In a problem hip, the worn cartilage no longer serves as a cushion. As the roughened bones rub together, they become irregular with a surface like sandpaper. The ball grinds in the socket when you move your leg, causing pain and stiffness. When a natural hip must be replaced, a prosthesis is used. An artificial ball replaces the head of the thigh bone and an artificial cup replaces the worn socket. A stem is inserted into the bone for stability. These parts connect to create your new artificial hip. All parts have smooth surfaces for comfortable movement once you have healed. Surgical techniques vary from surgeon to surgeon. You may want to discuss where your incision will be and how your incision will be closed in addition to the type of implant and whether your implant will be cemented or uncemented. Now, despite the techniques used, the desired outcome is still the same, and that is quality. The goal is a functioning hip without pain. But the ultimate outcome is also dependent upon you. You will get out of your recovery what you put into it. And remember that it is going to be very important that you follow all of your surgeon's instructions for the recovery phase. As with any type of surgical procedure, there are certain risks with hip surgery that your surgeon will discuss. Though complications are rare and extensive measures are taken to minimize these risks, it is important that you are aware of these possibilities and some actions to minimize them. Some may already have hip stiffness prior to surgery, and it is not uncommon to have it after surgery. Movement, mobility like walking, and exercises suggested by physical therapy and including ice therapy are effective in reducing stiffness and pain. Implant failure and component loosening. Fall prevention is critical during your rec recovery phase. If you are admitted for observation after surgery, you will see signs, call, don't fall, throughout the hospital. It is important to call for assistance when getting out of bed, out of a chair, and during ambulation. Carrying excess body weight and high impact activities can cause strain on the artificial joint and cause it to wear out early. Life expectancy of most implants is 15 to 20 years, possibly longer. Infection prevention begins before surgery and nutrition plays a vital role in healing. Protein is the building block of cells. Good sources of protein include lean meats, poultry, fish, eggs, dairy products, beans and legumes, and nuts and seeds. You should increase your lean sources of protein before surgery and during the recovery phase. 
protein supplements can be beneficial after surgery if you have decreased appetite. Vitamin A, C, and E are antioxidants that play a key role in immune function. Vitamin C can be found in citrus fruits, strawberries, kiwi, broccoli, and bell pepper. Good sources of vitamin A are liver, sweet potatoes, carrots, spinach, and kale. Vitamin E can be obtained from spinach, nuts and seeds, fortified cereals, and vegetable oil. Vitamin D helps the body absorb calcium and reduces inflammation and boosts the natural immune response of our body. Our bodies produce vitamin D from the ultraviolet rays of the sun, so get out and enjoy a nice sunny day. Many people, especially Alaskans, don't get enough vitamin D from the sun. Foods rich in vitamin D include fatty fish like salmon, beef liver, egg yolks, and fortified with vitamin D milk and some breakfast cereals. Also cheese, yogurt, and dark chocolate are good sources of vitamin D. Omega-3 rich foods help reduce inflammation and promote healing. These can also be found in fatty fish, walnuts, chia seeds, and flax seeds. Ensure you are getting enough calories because your body's energy needs increase during the recovery phase. Concentrate on whole foods instead of more processed foods. Smoking can interfere with anesthesia and decrease the blood supply to an area that is healing. Stop smoking before surgery as early as possible. Even a few days before surgery can be beneficial. High blood sugar levels can increase your risk of infection and delay healing. Stress can also increase blood sugar levels. We may be checking your blood sugar levels throughout the surgical process. Low body temperature or hypothermia can also have an effect on infection potential. You will be provided an air forced warming blanket in the preoperative area and a warm blanket for transfer to the operating room, which is normally very cold. Our goal is to maintain your body temperature and prevent hypothermia. Nasal screening for staph aureus is required for all total joint patients prior to surgery. A positive staph test does not mean you have an infection or that you can't have surgery, but it does mean you are at a higher risk for an infection. The antibiotic given before surgery depends on the results of this test. MRSA, which is methicillin resistant staph aureus, does require an additional antibiotic. Your surgeon may also prescribe an ointment called mupirocin to place inside your nostrils twice a day for five days prior to surgery and also request that you take additional chlorhexidine showers. For all total joints, we provide a product that is an alcohol citrus solution to treat your nostrils while in the preoperative area. Your preoperative nurse will explain this process and provide you with instructions. Chlorhexidine showering is requested both the night before surgery and the morning of for all total joint patients with an antimicrobial soap. This soap may be provided by your surgeon. You can pick that soap up at our registration desk and also if you do your pre-admission testing here at the hospital. If you are unable to obtain this special soap, you may use an over-the-counter soap like Gold Dial. We will discuss the exact process of this shower a little later in the presentation. Sterilization of surgical instruments and minimizing traffic in the operating rooms are also important to infection prevention and are things we strive to make sure we maintain. 
Bleeding excessively during surgery can be prevented. You will be required to stop anticoagulant medications. Those include some of the over-the-counter medications like aspirin, ibuprofen, and many herbal supplements. Discuss all medications with your surgeon. Medications like Ozempic and Jardians also need to be discontinued prior to surgery. Most medications need to be stopped anywhere from three days to two weeks prior to surgery. You can take Tylenol as Tylenol does not affect bleeding. Blood clots after surgery may occur up to several weeks after the procedure. You will be prescribed a blood thinning medication to begin after surgery. It is important to follow the medication instructions, including the length of time to take this medication. Blood clot prevention can be maximized substantially with early and frequent ambulation, movement, and foot pump exercises. While in the hospital, you will be provided with a machine called a sequential compression device. These are special leg or foot wraps connected to a machine that inflates and deflates the wrap. The pumping action acts like your muscles to help with blood flow and prevent blood clots. You will also be wearing compression stockings or TED hose that you will be requested to wear for a few weeks after surgery. You may remove these stockings daily to allow your legs to air out and also to verify that they are not causing any irritation. It is important before reapplying these hose to elevate your feet for about 10 to 15 minutes and then reapply those stockings. After discharge, walking every 30 to 60 minutes and performing those foot pump exercises will be important to deter development of blood clots. Hip dislocation is a risk after surgery. It is very important that you follow the precautions that we will discuss a little later in this presentation. This is especially important during the first several months of your healing. Also, fall prevention is important to decrease your risk of dislocation. Nerve damage can include numbness, weakness, tingling and burning, or prickly sensations. Nerves regenerate slowly. These sensations should resolve with time. Discuss with your surgeon if they do continue. Need for additional surgery may result from not following the pre- and post-operative instructions. It also can happen after a fall, also for not following your hip precautions. Some complications from anesthesia include nausea and vomiting and a sore throat after general anesthesia and could include a rare chance of a spinal headache or delayed ambulation due to decreased sensation in the legs after a spinal anesthetic. If you have ever had a history of nausea and vomiting, please discuss this with your anesthesia provider prior to surgery so that you can be pre-treated to decrease that risk. Let's talk about some tasks that need to be performed prior to surgery. One of the tasks you need to complete prior to coming into the hospital for surgery is registration. This can be done by phone at 907-264-1952 or online at alaskaregionalhospital.com. Your surgeon will order some pre-surgical lab work and x-rays to be done prior to surgery. These can be done sometimes at your primary care physician and sometimes they will need to be done here at the hospital. You will also need that MRSA swab that we talked about. Again, we accept MRSA swabs and lab work for up to 30 days prior to your procedure. We do prefer that the MRSA, the MRSA swab, is done at least one day prior to procedure. 
you will receive a pre-admission phone call that will review your medical history and medication update. Please make sure that you have a medication list that includes all of your medications and the times that you take them and that medication strength. Sometimes your surgeon will require clearance from cardiology, pulmonology, urology, or any other physicians that you normally see. The night before surgery, eat a healthy dinner high in protein. No alcoholic beverages, please. Your instructions will be that you are not to eat anything or chew gum after midnight the night prior to surgery. If you do have a late surgical time frame scheduled, you may be told that you may eat up to eight hours prior to surgery. You may drink clear liquids that are not carbonated or caffeinated up to two hours prior to surgery. This includes water and Gatorade type products. You may also be given a pre-surgical carbohydrate sub supplement that you can drink at least two to three hours before your scheduled surgical time. This is a clear product that still follows that clear liquid up to two hours before surgery. This product is only available from the facility. It can be picked up at our pre-admission uh, testing site or at the registration desk. You will be instructed on the guidelines for medications that you may or may not take before surgery. During your pre-admission phone call, when they review your medications, they will give you final instructions on what medications to take or hold prior to surgery. If you are diabetic, it is important that you have the discussion regarding the type of medications that you take and how those medications should be taken or not taken prior to surgery. As discussed, infection is a risk after surgery. We are going to talk about a pre-surgical shower to aid in infection prevention. Please do not shave any parts of your body for 24 hours prior to surgery. The night before surgery, I'd like you to get into the shower, do your normal body wash and shampoo with your normal products that you use. Then I would like you to take the applicator provided by your surgeon or a clean, freshly laundered washcloth with half a bottle of the chlorhexidine soap provided by the hospital. Once you have the washcloth wet, I would like you to turn off the water and apply that liquid soap from your chin all the way down to your toes. Again, this can be done with a washcloth or whatever your surgeon has provided for you. Please do not get that soap into your eyes or your ears. I do want you to leave that soap on your skin for at least two minutes. That is why we asked you to turn the water off. Once two minutes has passed, you can turn the, back, the water back on, rinse off well. When you do get out of the shower, I want you to dry your skin with a freshly washed towel and I would like you to get into clean bed clothes and sleep in freshly laundered sheets. The morning of your surgery, we would ask that you take another shower. It is not necessary to shower with your normal soap and shampoo. We would like you to perform the shower as described on the previous slide from the night before with that same chlorhexidine soap. Remember, after applying the soap, leave it on your skin for about two minutes prior to rinsing. After coming out of the shower, we would like you to put on clean clothes that you can wear to the hospital. Remember to wear something that is loose fitting and easy to put on and off. Some of the worst things to wear are blue jeans or yoga pants. The morning of surgery after your shower, please do not place any lotions, perfumes, powders, or deodorant on your skin that morning. 
Now let's move on to the day of surgery. When coming to the hospital, I would like you to leave certain things at home. That includes large amounts of money, all medications. Please bring a list of medications, but please do not bring any medications to the hospital. Leave any valuable items and especially all jewelry at home. You may bring your phone and a charger, but we prefer to limit any valuables to having your family bring them once you are up in your room. Also, please do not bring preconceived negative notions. Having a good positive outlook is important to have a good recovery after your surgery. There are some items that we definitely would like you to bring to the hospital. One of those is your insurance card and identification. Bring a list of all your regular medications, including the dose, the frequency, and when you had last taken that medication. You can bring personal hygiene items like deodorants, toothbrush, toothpaste, although we do have a toothbrush and toothpaste that we can provide for you. We do not have deodorant, so you may want to bring your deodorant. Make sure that you have comfortable clothes that you have worn in, which you can also wear home. But we also suggest that you bring a pair of shorts or some type of pajama bottoms that you can wear while ambulating in the hallways to maintain your modesty if you are wearing our hospital gowns. A CPAP or a BiPAP, if used at home, should be brought to the hospital. Bring the unit and your mask and we will provide the water. It is important that you have something to distract yourself or help relax after surgery. Sometimes people prefer to bring music, uh, CD players, those types of things. We do have direct TV in all the rooms and we do have internet capabilities, but please remember this is an unsecured internet. So don't be looking up at your bank account or buying things online where you have to enter uh, personal information. Bring your glasses, hearing aids, dentures. Those will be important through your recovery phase. You will need a walker on the day of discharge. While you are in the hospital, we will supply a walker for your use, but we would like you to have a two wheel walker in your vehicle so that on the day of discharge, you will have that walker to get from your vehicle into your home. Most importantly, we do want you to bring that confidence in yourself. We are here to help you and we know that you're going to do well. You need to have that confidence in yourself that you will do well also. On the day of surgery, you will be coming to the hospital about two hours prior to the scheduled start of your surgery. You will come in and check in at the registration desk, which is on the second floor. They will send you down to the operating room waiting area and I would suggest that you also check in at the reception desk there to let them know that you are in the area and ready to proceed. A nurse will come out and take you into that pre-surgical room where you will be prepared for surgery. They will get you in a hospital gown, start an IV, and you will also meet with your surgeon and anesthesia provider while you were in that room. Ask about the texting system and patient access code that we use to provide progress updates. Again, your surgeon, anesthesia provider, and operating room nurse will all visit you in that preoperative area. Your family and friends will be asked to leave during your procedure. You may have two members of your family in that preoperative area with you until you are taken to the operating room. After surgery, you will be taken to the recovery room. Sometimes you will hear the PACU, P-A-C-U, used as a terminology for the recovery room, which stands for post-anesthesia care unit. 
your surgeon will speak to your family or whoever you have designated for him to speak with by phone after the completion of your surgical procedure. We do allow visitation after you have been removed from the recovery room and taken either to your hospital room or into phase two recovery where you will be prior to your discharge if you are doing outpatient procedures. Let's talk about post-operative or after surgery. Once the anesthetic begins to wear off, you will be moved to phase two recovery if you are going home or to one of the hospital rooms for observation in the orthopedic and spine center. This is a picture of the hospital rooms on the orthopedic unit. All of our rooms are private rooms. They all have private baths that accommodate walkers. Our total joint program has received the Joint Commission Golden Seal of Approval. We are considered a certified total joint program. While you are here for observation, you will have an orthopedic care team that includes a charge nurse who oversees the orthopedic unit, a bedside nurse who will be assigned specifically for your care, all of our nurses in the facility wear navy blue. You will also see nursing assistants or patient care technicians who wear a plum colored uniform. You will see physical therapy and occupational therapy, and we will talk about the differences in therapy and how that will pertain to your recovery. Our therapists do wear green scrubs. Of course, your surgeon is the main part of your orthopedic care team, but there are times that he will ask a hospitalist to also come and be involved in your care. Once you arrive to your hospital room, you may have the following equipment connected to you when you arrive. You will be having some oxygen, which is a little cannula that is in through your nose that helps you to breathe fresh oxygenated air. You will have a pulse oximeter, which is a little sticky pad on your finger that is measuring the oxygen concentration in your blood. You will have IV fluids and potentially IV antibiotics. We will keep the IV fluids going until you are eating and drinking and keeping down foods with no nausea and vomiting. We will disconnect the fluids, but the IV itself will remain in place until right before you are discharged in case we do need it for fluids or medication. You will have ice packs potentially even a cryotherapy unit for you to use on your surgical site. We do find that ice does help to reduce swelling and sometimes pain. You will have that sequential compression device machine that we talked about earlier and those compression stockings on. Occasionally, especially patients that have had spinal anesthetic, may have a foam wedge between the legs to help keep your legs in a position that we would like them to be in while you were lying in bed. Again, part of this foam wedge will help to keep your legs uh, separated slightly and also will help to keep your toes pointed towards your nose, which is one of the things that we will be talking about when we talk about your restrictions after surgery. You potentially may have a drain. That drain is normally removed prior to you being discharged from the hospital. And you will have some sort of a dressing over the incision site. The closure and dressings are surgeon dependent. You may ask them ahead of time what type of skin closure they will be performing and what type of dressing you may have. If you do need to have dressing changes, we will be providing you all the dressing supplies necessary for dressing changes after discharge. Let's talk about types of pain and pain management. 
There are two different types of pain. One is acute pain, and that is the kind of surgical incision pain that you may experience here in the hospital. It usually comes on suddenly and also passes relatively quickly. The other type of pain is chronic pain, and this is pain that persists over weeks or months or even years, and it can be the result of any injury, illnesses, or disease, including having some type of arthritis that precipitated the need for your total hip surgery. Pain management after surgery can be successfully managed with your patient care team and you. Our goal is to reduce pain and make it manageable so that you can work with physical therapy, occupational therapy, and become as independent as possible during your hospital stay. Please remember, you will not be totally pain-free after surgery. After surgery, you will experience that pain, that acute incisional and surgical pain. Remember, as your recovery progresses, this pain will go away with time. Here at the hospital, we use a pain scale to help our patients and nursing staff work together for pain management. Our scale is zero, means you don't have any pain at all, up to 10, which is the worst pain that you've ever experienced. Also, when we are discussing pain, it is helpful if you can be specific in describing the type of pain you have. Different types of pain do require different treatments. We are committed to treating and managing each person's pain after surgery. There are different routes which we give pain medications through to help treat your pain. IV pain medication is one way that we give pain medication, primarily in that early recovery phase. IV medication acts fairly quickly but it does not last very long and you can't go home with IV pain medication. So as early as possible, we will get you started on oral pain medication or pain medication that you take by mouth. This pain medication normally takes about 20 to 30 minutes before you see the result, but the nice part is that this type of pain medication can last for hours. Let's talk about what to expect on the day of surgery. Once you arrive in the hospital room, we will have you up walking with staff. Sometimes, if you are capable, we can have you walk from the recovery room stretcher to the bed in your room. Our goal for ambulation is within six hours of the completion of your surgical procedure. The first ambulation, you will walk with two staff members. You will be using a two-wheel front wheel walker, and we will have a gait belt on you for safety. We will be weaning you off of the oxygen based on the pulse oximeter readings. Our goal is 93% consistently. You will be using an incentive spirometer. This we like you to use about 10 times an hour to prevent pneumonia, and it also helps to expel the anesthesia gases that are in your lungs. You will be having that IV fluid and possibly IV antibiotics that we will discontinue once you are taking fluids and food by mouth without nausea and vomiting. The IV itself will be the last thing removed prior to your discharge. You will start on clear liquids and advance to solid foods once you have started passing gas and we know that your system is capable of handling solid foods. You will see physical therapy and occupational therapy either the day of surgery or the next morning. It is important that we verify the ability to have you safely discharge to your home environment. We will be working again on that pain management. We do need to have that pain level manageable so that you can go home, but do remember that you will not be totally pain free. 
And the main question people ask, when can I go home? Your care team determines when you are ready to go home. One of the things we want to verify is that you can get in and out of bed by yourself or with limited assistance as long as you have that limited assistance available after discharge. We want to make sure that you are independent with the daily activities that occupational therapy will be addressing, things like dressing and toileting. We want to make sure that you can eat without nausea or vomiting. We want to make sure that you are passing gas or have had a bowel movement. You may not have a bowel movement prior to your discharge, but constipation prevention is very important after surgery. Due to anesthetics, limited mobility, limited fluid intake, and the addition of narcotic pain medications, constipation is not uncommon after surgery and prevention becomes very important. We want to make sure that your oral pain medications are controlling your pain to allow you to mobilize freely when you get home. We want to make sure that you are safely walking with an assistive device and that you can climb stairs if you have stairs at home. It is important that we know the number of stairs you have and which side is your handrail so that we can practice stairs prior to your discharge. We want to make sure that you are performing those home exercises and that you are following your hip precautions. How to prepare for the day of discharge. Prior to your departure, there are a few tasks that must be completed. We need to make sure that any medical equipment that you need is available. So having that walker in your vehicle is important if you are required to use a walker. Your surgeon will come in bright and early and complete your discharge order when he feels you are ready to go home. If they give you any new prescriptions, our pharmacy will verify that none of those prescriptions interfere with any medications that you are already taking. Your nursing team will then review those discharge instructions and prepare written instructions for you. Your bedside nurse or occupational therapist will assist you in getting prepared to leave the facility. And once your family has come to pick you up, we will review those discharge instructions that include medication, appointments, and therapy, and provide you with that after-visit summary in writing. You will then be taken by wheelchair to the hospital entrance and wished a speedy recovery, but again, making sure that you are aware that we are here if you need us. Let's review some information that's gonna be very important for managing at home. When it comes to effective pain management, the tips you learned in the hospital will also work at home. A couple things to remember are to use your medication only as directed. Do not take it prior to the prescribed time frame. As your pain lessens, Try taking your medication less often or decreasing the strength of medication that you are using. Remember, medications do take time to work. Usually oral medications are effective in about 20 to 30 minutes. Time your medications around your activity, such as dressing, sitting at the dinner table, or therapy. It is important that you take that medication so that you can be comfortable when doing those activities. Multimodal pain medication may be prescribed. This may be something as simple as Tylenol. We will discuss multimodal pain medications that are prescribed for you during that discharge timeframe. The use of ice packs and elevation can be very beneficial in decreasing swelling and decreasing pain. We've talked about infection prevention, so it is important to keep your wound clean and dry. You may shower, 
pat the area dry as soon as you get out of the shower, but remember that you are not to soak in a bathtub or in any type of a pool or even a sauna where that area could get soaky wet. It is important that you follow the dressing instructions that we give you. And again, we will give you dressings if you need those after you get home. Please keep whatever dressings we supply in a clean closed container away from kids and pets. And again, making sure that when you are changing those dressings, that you are doing that in a clean area, again, away from pets and children. Wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. It is really important during dressing changes that you wash your hands before removing the old dressing, wash your hands before applying the new dressing, and washing your hands once the dressing has been applied. You are going to be watching for signs and symptoms of infection. They include redness, pain, heat, and swelling. Sometimes if you are having drainage, a new drainage or the way the drainage looks or smells could be indicative of a potential infection. Also, a fever, rise in your temperature. If your temperature raises over 100.4, you should be reaching out to your doctor. Sometimes people complain about changes in how they feel. Sometimes it's as simple as nausea, dizziness, chills, or fatigue. If you are experiencing any of these symptoms, please reach out to your primary care physician or your surgeon. You will be watching for signs and symptoms of blood clots. A deep vein thrombosis, also known as a DVT, normally occurs in the leg. And it could be where you have swelling, particularly in the calf, or pain in the calf that is unrelated to the incision site. It also could be an area of swelling that does not resolve with elevation of the extremity. You are also going to be watching for those blood clots called pulmonary embolism or PE. Usually this will be shortness of breath, sudden onset of chest pain, or localized chest pain with coughing. If you have these symptoms, it is important that you go directly to an emergency room. Remember that nutrition is a vital part of your overall healing after surgery. Eating several servings of fruits and vegetables, drinking plenty of fluids, and thinking about that good lean protein after surgery and how important it is in healing. Continue exercising with the exercises that you have been provided by physical therapy up until you have gone to outpatient therapy. Remember that you want to gradually increase your activities and these will help to ensure that your hip is healing as desired. Remember frequent ambulation elevation of the extremity to decrease swelling, including ice therapy. Keeping some written records after surgery can be very beneficial, especially when it comes to pain medication. It can be easy to forget the time you had taken that medication. Walks, again, begin with short, frequent walks and increase those as tolerated. Keep track of your walking so that when you start therapy, they will have an idea of your progression. Again, doing those exercises. It is important that those exercises provided by physical therapy are continued until you are going to outpatient therapy if that is required. And again, remember to keep a record and keep on top of your bowel movements. Again, constipation is common after surgery due to narcotics, anesthesia, decreased mobility, and decreased fluid intake. Some people find that coffee helps to stimulate bowel movements. Things like prune juices, apple ciders, 
Also, there are some medications that can be taken that either add fiber to your diet, but remember with fiber, you need fluid. And there also are some stool softeners or stool softeners with mild laxatives that your surgeon may prescribe or ask you to pick up. Many of these can be obtained over the counter. Hello, I'm Gary, an occupational therapist here at Alaska Regional Hospital. And today we're gonna to be talking about therapy in the hospital. We're gonna be covering things about therapy that you're gonna receive while you're here at Alaska Regional Hospital, and also things to prepare for home for a successful return after your surgery here. One thing I do wanna highlight while here in the hospital is that your therapy will be individualized to you as a patient and your discharge plan. Some patients have very high needs and will have more therapy than others who have lower needs. Again, the plan will be individualized and planning for discharge home. When it comes to therapy, often I refer to three goals of therapy, and they're going to be centered around that safe discharge that I mentioned. The first goal is going to be no falls. We're going to be focusing on safe mobility and activity. The second goal is going to be no infections. We want you to have a safe home environment to go home to prevent infections at that surgical site. And the third goal is going to be not breaking those movement precautions, what we refer to as restrictions after surgery. So let's talk about those restrictions. You'll often hear the term hip precautions. And when you hear that term, I want you to think movement restrictions, and you can use those interchangeably. These movement restrictions will typically last for six to 12 weeks after surgery, and then you'll have a slow progression back to normal activity and normal movements. These hip precautions, those movement restrictions, normally are centered around the style of surgery that your surgeon will perform to replace your hip. If they go in from the front or the anterior approach, you have anterior hip precautions. If they go in from the back, the posterior approach, you'll have posterior hip precautions. There are some variations, so please check with your surgeon on the specific style of surgery he's going to do. For anterior precautions, the movements we want you to avoid for six to 12 weeks are not extending your leg back, not turning your foot outward, and not crossing your legs. For posterior precautions, we do not want you to bend your hips past 90 degrees, turn your foot inward, and also not crossing your legs. Please note that these precautions are sort of the opposite of each other. So please don't take advice from random people on your hip precaution because they may be giving you bad advice even if they have experience with previous hip surgeries as well. So here is a picture of those anterior precautions. I do feel like a visual is a little bit more easy to conceptualize. At the top photo, you can see that we do not want you kicking that leg or extending that leg behind you. And the second photo is a clear picture of what we don't want you to do, and that's crossing your legs, especially while you're sitting. We do not want your legs crossing what we refer to as midline. And then that last picture at the bottom, you can see we do not want you turning your foot out. Again, these are anterior hip precautions. And with this picture, we have the opposite, the posterior hip precautions. You can see in the first picture, we do not want you flexing your hip forward. This also counts if you're sitting down. We do not want you bending too far forward and breaking that 90 degrees from your hip to your back. In the second picture, we do not want you crossing those legs, especially when sitting down or crossing midline at all. In the last picture, we do not want you turning your foot in or going pigeon-toed. Again, these are posterior hip precautions. So now I want to introduce you to the therapy that you're going to get in the hospital. All of our major joint surgeries will receive therapy in the hospital with the plan of having a safe discharge home. Again, this will be individualized to you and your discharge plan. The first therapy that you'll likely receive is physical therapy. Most people are familiar with physical therapy and their goal is to work on walking, mobility, and exercises. They'll be practicing things with you such as stairs, walking with a walker, getting in and out of bed, and following those precautions. They may be using a walker or a gait belt as equipment in the hospital. As mentioned, physical therapy will be working on with you on mobility. The picture on the left, what we refer to as a front wheeled walker, is likely the walker that we will recommend for you going home after any kind of major orthopedic surgery. 
These walkers can be acquired locally and we do recommend people to acquire these walkers prior to surgery. That way it is ready and waiting for you at home. While you are in the hospital, you will be borrowing and using one of our walkers while you're here. However, you cannot take our walkers home with you. On the right, we do have a person using what we refer to as a gate belt. The gate belt that you will be provided with in the hospital will be yours to take home, and we use it whenever we get patients up and walking to make sure that we can hold on to you and keep you steady as you go. The second therapy that you will likely receive while in the hospital is occupational therapy. Most people aren't as familiar with occupational therapy, but we deal with what we refer to as the activities of daily living. We focus on functional independence, and the things that we like to work on are bathing, dressing, grooming, those day-to-day -day things that you want to be as independent with at home as possible. Equipment that we may be using are reachers, sock aids, toilet aids, other devices that allow you to do those day-to-day -day things within those precautions. On this slide, I have the picture of one of the common items that you may receive from occupational therapy, the reacher. Some people refer to this as the grabber. You can use these terms interchangeably. The picture on the left is of a standard reacher and the type that we carry here in the hospital. The picture in the middle is a person using that reacher for some everyday items. Using the reacher for these items can make things easier for you and staying within those precautions to make sure that you do not damage that surgical site. So they're very handy for picking things up, grabbing blankets, grabbing clothing. But what we also use these items for are for getting dressed. After a major joint surgery with a lower extremity involved, sometimes getting pants, underwear, socks, shoes on can be very tricky. And the reacher is one of those items that can help with that. On the right, you can see a diagram of a gentleman using a reacher or something known as a dressing stick as well. It's the same technique to get pants on. And this is something that occupational therapy can work with you on after your surgery. Another common item that occupational therapy may teach you about is the sock aid. As you can see on the picture on the left, it's basically a plastic tube with a rope attached to it. And as we go to the next picture, you can see how it is utilized. This gentleman threads the sock onto the plastic tube and while sitting down, throws that sock aid and sock onto the ground, reels it in towards his foot and gets that sock onto his foot without breaking those precautions. There's another diagram on the right showing the same technique with a slightly different sock aid. So now let's talk about some preparation that you can do to your home prior to surgery to make it a safer discharge. The more planning and preparation you do before surgery, generally the easier it is to get home after surgery. And remember those three goals that I mentioned earlier for going home. My three rules are no falls, no infections, and don't break your surgical precautions. Some things that we suggest most patients do prior to surgery are cleaning your home and vacuuming your carpets, laundering your bedding and your comfortable clothes, disinfecting and cleaning your bathrooms, including your toilets, showers, and sinks, removing clutter, and prioritize easy access to common use items. Think about the items that you're going to be using over the ne next six to 12 weeks. Remember, you're going to have those movement restrictions or precautions for six to 12 weeks after surgery. When it comes to prioritizing and getting easy access to those items, I use the catchphrase waist to face. If something is below your waist, sometimes it is hard to reach within your precautions. And if it's above your face, sometimes it can be dangerous. So try to keep the clothes, house items, things that you're going to be using over the next few weeks, keep them in that zone between your waist and your face. Now let's break your house down into each room and talk about things that you can do to prepare those rooms in your home for successful and safe discharge home. The first room of the home that I want to discuss is your bathroom. The bathroom is a high fall risk area. So please be extra careful whenever you're going in and out of your bathroom. The first thing I want to discuss is bathing. Remember, after surgery, we do not want you soaking your incision, so we are going to recommend that you take showers only when cleared by your physician to shower. For showering, we do recommend sitting down to shower on something like a shower chair or a tub bench. If you have a walk-in shower, we often recommend a standard shower chair, and if you have a tub shower, we recommend a tub bench to make it easier to get in and out of that tub without having to step up and over a tall ledge. Handheld shower heads and grab bars also make things very easy 
for showering. And remember, no soaking. When it comes to toileting, please pay attention to the height of your toilet. Sometimes we do recommend a toilet riser or a frame to raise up the level of that toilet to make it easier to sit and stand from that surface. So here are some of those items that I discussed. On the top left, you can see a picture of a tub transfer bench. Please note that it is hanging over the edge of the tub because it allows you to back up, sit down on the edge of that bench, and swing your legs into the tub to avoid having to step up and over that tall ledge. On the bottom left, you can see a picture of a standard shower chair. These normally can be acquired locally or online, and we do recommend people to get these items prior to surgery if you think you may need one so you can try it out before surgery. The middle picture is a clamp on grab bar. These will clamp onto the edge of your tub if you do have a tub shower combination. Generally, we like the clamp on grab bars, but we generally suggest staying away from suction cup grab bars because those can slip or pop off without warning. The diagram on the right is the technique used to get in and out of a tub bench or a tub shower using a tub bench. And you can see the patient backs up sits down and swings her legs into the tub without having to step up and over that edge being extra safe. So now let's talk about some toilet equipment to make getting on and off the toilet slightly easier. The left two pictures are pictures of a toilet frame. Sometimes these are referred to as a three-in-one bedside commode. And as you can see on the most left picture, the bottom bucket of that porta potty can be removed and it can be slid over top of a toilet like in the middle picture to elevate that surface and give you grab bars. The most right picture is a toilet riser, and that riser actually has grab bars connected to it. Some risers have grab bars, some do not, but please, if you do get a riser or a toilet frame, please try them out prior to surgery to make sure they fit your specific toilet and are nice and sturdy for you to get on and off the toilet with. The next two rooms that I want to discuss are the bedroom and the kitchen. I like to talk about these rooms together because I want to refer back to my catchphrase, waist to face. Remember that reaching above your face or below your waist after surgery can put you at risk of a fall or breaking your precautions. So set up your closets, your dressers, your kitchen cabinets, anything that you're going to be getting into for a few weeks after surgery, make them easy to access. Remember that the clothing you're going to be wearing is going to be stretchy, baggy, comfy clothes for easy access after surgery. Also think about your bed height. If a bed is too high or too low, it may be very difficult to get in and out of. And when it comes to the kitchen, preparing meals in advance can make life a whole lot easier going home from surgery. And remember, a healthy diet high in protein helps healing and helps prevent infections. In for review, I wanted to include a diagram on how to get lower body dressing completed using equipment that occupational therapy may give you going home. So again, when setting up your bedroom, make that clothing easy to get and keep those adaptive equipment handy because with the diagram on the left is how we may teach you how to get pants on after surgery and the diagram on the right may be how we teach you to put socks on after surgery. So now let's talk about your general living space. Remember that you're going to need ample room to mobilize in your home with a walker. So remove clutter and make space around furniture so you can ambulate and mobilize safely. Also consider lighting options in your home. Dark, dim rooms can be a fall hazard, so please consider night lights or dim lighting in your home or even in Alaska in the summertime, keeping your blinds open at night. When it comes to stairs, please remove clutter from the stairs and keep them clean and clear. Count the number of stairs you have in your home and pay attention to where your handrail is because after surgery, physical therapy will work on going up and down the stairs prior to discharge home. If your house has multiple levels and you're able to stay on one floor of your home, please consider staying on that one level to eliminate having to go up and down stairs, which is also a high fall risk area. When it comes to furniture in your home, we do prefer firm chairs with arms because getting up and down from chairs with arms is slightly easier because you have something to push from. Be cautious of recliners because deep, low recliners may be tricky to get in and out of. Before going home, play musical chairs. Try sitting on all of your chairs to make sure you can get down and up from those after surgery within those precautions. If a chair is difficult to get in and out of now, it may be more difficult to get in and out of after surgery. And when it comes to rugs, general rule, we want you to remove all of your throw rugs and clear all of your walkways. 
Pro rugs can get caught underfoot and get caught on your walker, and there's very limited reasons to need throw rugs after surgery. When it comes to transportation, please note that you will have driving restrictions based on your physician orders. So going home as a passenger, please pick a vehicle that is easy to get in and out of. Generally speaking, a mid-sized vehicle, something that's not too high, not too low, is the easiest. We will be talking and teaching you different ways to get in and out of your specific vehicle with therapy after surgery. One of the most common ways that we teach patients to get in and out of your vehicle prior to discharge is backing up to your car, sitting down, and swinging your legs into the car. This is something I would recommend practicing prior to surgery, just like you have to play musical chairs with all of your furniture at home, play musical chairs with your vehicle to make sure that you can get in and out safely and that your vehicle is appropriate for you for discharge. Generally speaking, we do not like step stools or trying to climb into a car face forward because it puts you at risk of a fall. And lastly, let's talk about pets. Please have a plan to care for your pet, including walking and feeding your pet. Again, reaching down for a pet can break your precautions and put you at risk of a fall. Picking up pets can be dangerous. Walking pets on leashes can be dangerous as well. Whenever you get home, we often recommend the driver of your vehicle to put your pet away, allowing you to come into your home safely and get sitting down, then allowing the pet to come out and visit you so that way something like a dog can't knock you down. When it comes to cats, they often like to get underfoot, and that's where lighting can come in handy to make sure that you don't trip on your cat at home. And please keep your pets, dogs, cats, birds, any kind of pet away from your incision site, and we don't recommend you to sleep or use the same blankets as your pet does. And lastly, for a safe discharge home, please remember the three main goals of therapy. No falls, no infections, and don't break those movement precautions. Please, if you have any questions, talk to your physical therapist or occupational therapist about any concerns you have returning home safely. For questions and to receive credit for this educational program, please contact me, Donna Kager, at Alaska Regional Hospital. My office number is 907-264 1481 or you can email me at donna.kager at hcahealthcare.com. Thank you for viewing our presentation and I wish you well on your upcoming surgery.